The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, and your faithfulness too. And in the assembly of the holy ones, we will praise your name. Well, President Lindsay and Rebecca, trustees, distinguished guests, faculty, students, friends, all, welcome to this day of great celebration. How fitting it is for us to gather together on this momentous occasion in the life of the college, in the life of Michael and Rebecca Lindsay, to pause before the Lord God, our Maker and our Redeemer. This institution was born of a prayer-filled vision to educate and equip men and women from all walks of life and fitting them, preparing them for competent, creative, courageous, and compassionate service to neighbors in the name of Christ, both nearby and far across the globe to the glory of God. And now, 122 years later, through God's good provision, through the faithful service of generations of administrators and faculty and staff, through diligent studies of our students, that vision remains vibrant and growing. And our future, too, will depend upon God's good provision, on the willingness of students and of able faculty, staff, and administrators. So let us this morning worship together. Let us unite our hearts and our voices in gratitude and in praise, in dependence and in hope, calling upon the one who both plants the seed of vision and who grants a harvest of blessing to the glory of his name and the prosperity of his kingdom. So let us, through our actions, affirm together with the psalmist where it is written, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness. I will declare your, that your love stands firm forever and that you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. Praise be to the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Please stand and join as Dr. Gordon Hugenberger leads us in the invocation. Let us bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, we've gathered here on this gorgeous, brisk end of summer day to worship you first and foremost. We love you. You're the great I am. You said, let there be light, and there was light. You made the earth by your power and stretched out the heavens by your understanding. There's nothing that we have that we did not receive from your wonderful hands. Lord Jesus, the word made flesh, we do love you. We worship you. We adore you and praise your holy name. Yours is the name that is above every name in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And Lord, we are amazed at your sovereign power and majesty as the word through whom and for whom all things were made. You're not only our creator, you are our redeemer, the great savior of sinners who gave your life that we might have life, who became like us that we might become like you. Twice over we belong to you. You have every right to our unwavering love and joyful obedience. But to our shame we confess that we have sinned against your goodness times without number and are guilty of pride and unbelief, of flagrant disobedience, willful ignorance, complacency, and an inexcusable neglect to seek you in our daily lives. We love you, but not enough. We trust you, but not with our whole being. We worship you, but not as the one who is supremely deserving of our unswerving loyalty, the sacrifice of our lives, and our unbounded praise. Stretch forth your nail-pierced hands and bless. Forgive, heal, restore, and draw us to yourself. 
Help us so that when we remember our past failures with a tender conscience, we will not be thinking of all the shameful things that we have committed, but of all the shameful things that you have forgiven. Help us not to recall in self-condemnation how often we have gone astray, but to recall in adoration how often you left the 99 and came and found us who were hopelessly lost and carried us back in your arms of love. Help us to worship you as is fitting this morning. We thank you for the wonderful occasion that brings us together as we pray for our brother Michael Lindsay and recognize before you the privileged calling that you have placed on his life to serve you and love you with all his heart and soul and mind and strength and to love those for whom you died. Fill him and fill each of us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Please do something mighty in Michael's life today. Do something mighty in each of us today so that you might do something mighty through us in the days ahead to use us as more faithful and effective instruments of your blessing to others. Do it, we pray, for the sake of your honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Let's continue our worship singing Holy, 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 number 262 in your hymnals.
I invite you to be seated. What does Wenham have to do with Sri Lanka? Of course, I've pirated Tertullian's rhetorical question that highlights the apparently unbridgeable chasm between two worldviews. For him, philosophical Athens had precious little to do with Jerusalem. Before I explore that question further, let me emphasize on behalf of staff and faculty that the calling to be at Gordon is God's gift to us. We do not take for granted the rich blessings of work and of collegiality. We are grateful to God for the privilege and sobering responsibility of pouring our lives into the next generation. But to return to my question, what does Wenham have to do with, frankly, most of the rest of the world? Perhaps there is no getting across the chasm surrounding our New England evangelical subculture. We're wealthy. We pride ourselves on thinking Christianly in an already quasi-Christian culture. We explore our academic freedom splashing about in pools of esoteric questions. At the same time, however, Gordon's historic international focus has enabled staff, faculty, and students to build bridges across many chasms to a wide range of other worlds. The community in Sri Lanka, Kitusevana, that I have in my heart thrives in the midst of a primarily Buddhist culture, often hostile to the tiny Christian minority. These folks are hardly awash in possessions. Nevertheless, in the aftermath of the two, December 2004 tsunami, they spearheaded rebuilding efforts on the devastated south coast. They sustain now vibrant ministries to widows, orphans, and abandoned children. Prashant Visser came to Gordon from Sri Lanka, and he blessed us in countless ways. His efforts since returning home have been devoted to reconciliation in the war-torn and corruption-ridden country. Prashant has arranged for Gordon students, as well as faculty, to work with Kitu Sevana over the last half decade. What have we learned from our sisters and brothers there? Well, for one thing, the powerful invasion of the Holy Spirit transforming lives is inescapably present. And on the darker side, we've had to come face to face with the cosmic battle raging around us. We ignore it to our peril. We cease to pray to our peril. The blessings of these lessons, only briefly sketched, cannot be taken for granted. We are indeed, as faculty and staff, grateful to the Lord of the universe who has brought us to this place. As Dr. Phillips just said, Gordon College is in Wenham, Massachusetts. And sometimes Wenham feels like a pretty small place. It may seem kind of obvious, but as a current student, sometimes I let that inform my expectations of how Gordon is capable of blessing my life and blessing the whole world. So when I went abroad to study philosophy in Edinburgh, Scotland, I did not expect to find Gordon there. Edinburgh is not Wenham. But Gordon is not just incredible because of Wenham, though it's beautiful, as I'm sure you're about to find out, or have already. But Gordon is incredible because of the people God has brought here. Scotland did not have this spacious chapel. It didn't have the professors I've come to love over the years. It didn't have 1,500 Christian college students working together to become more like Christ in an intellectual setting. But Scotland did have Gordon. There was a graduate a Gordon graduate who was working in a college ministry at, at a, a local church in the university, at the University of Edinburgh. And I found myself sitting in this ministry week after week, Sunday after Sunday, learning scripture from a Gordon graduate in Edinburgh. I found myself being blessed by Gordon in Scotland. And it wasn't just for me. This, this alumni was not running a college ministry for Gordon study abroad students. <laughs> No, she was running it for the students of the UK. I had the privilege of watching Gordon bless the world abroad, even though I was a student here and now. It changed my perspective of the place. I realized that this Wenham, though beautiful, is just a launching pad. It's a training ground for our futures. It's to the chagrin of many of us that our once, what we once thought was a four-year degree is actually a lifelong process. <laughs> but. I'm excited to know that what I learned here during these years is just the beginning of what God can use Gordon for in my life 
and allow me to bless other places in the world. Gordon may be in Wenham, and Wenham may be in Massachusetts, but God is working everywhere. And whether it's in Sri Lanka or Scotland or anywhere the alumni of this college go, Gordon is a part of that work. As alumna of Gordon College, I have witnessed firsthand what a blessing Gordon has been and con continues to be to the surrounding community. Gordon College is a unique place. All aspects of this institution have left its mark on the world. Structurally, the college, epitomized by the striking chapel, brick edifices, and comely grounds, have come to be viewed as a pillar of strength and a place of refuge for families living in the surrounding communities. Events such as Gordon College Family Day has drawn crowds of families that may not have heard the word of God and felt his grace otherwise. The education received at Gordon College, vigorous academic pursuits within the framework of faith, has led alumni to find their vocations in all aspects of life. Currently, alumni are serving God through various locations, including medicine, as doctors, nurses, and even as the director of a hospital patient relations in the United Arab Emirates. Other vocations include vocations of faith as pastors, youth ministers, and crisis workers, while others are serving on a larger stage that include the United States Senate and international organizations such as the World Health Organization and Cure International. This spiritual environment of Gordon has also offered many opportunities for alumni to see the need for servitude in all corners of the world. Alumni are found in numerous locations, Within our backyard, they are serving God through local organizations such as SPIN, a Lynn nonprofit organization that provides an array of services to local families. Alumni are also found worldwide, serving God in the capacity that He has called them to do so. Currently, alumni are serving Him through organizations such as Crash Japan, which prepares Christians in Japan to be ready to provide relief when disaster strikes. Finally, the community of Gordon College has served as a guiding model that illuminates the grace of God. It has helped shape alumni to become beacons of light beyond the boundaries of this campus. Alumni often lovingly refer to Gordon as a bubble. What is amazing about the Gordon experience, it has deepened our faith. It has cultivated knowledge, and it has created a maturation of mind, body, and spirit. As a result, we as alumni take what we have learned and carry the spirit of Gordon of Christ within our hearts and share their grace within the community and beyond. Now please stand if you are able and open the hymnals to hymn 26, A Mighty God, for A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
please be seated. Good morning. What a thrill it is to be here with you today. It's so encouraging to look out and see so many familiar faces. Of course, I see our faithful family. I see my parents. I see Michael's parents. My grandmother. Michael's grandmother. My brother and many aunts and uncles. Cheering us on here are church friends from Princeton and Houston. I see Michael's college roommate. Our next door neighbors from seminary classmates from Princeton, as well as teachers who have taught alongside me. Michael and I are so blessed to have our neighbors from Oxford, as well as many professor friends from Rice University and institutions all across the country. Even now, dear friends are staying up late to watch this live from India. Thank you for taking time out of your lives and busy schedules to be with us here today. We're so honored you're here. I wish I had time to introduce all the special people that are here, but I do uh, have the special privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. John Ortberg. Many of you know him as the pastor of Menlo Park Presbyterian Church in California. You probably all know him as the author of many books with terrific titles, including The Life You've Always Wanted, If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. And my personal favorite, everybody's normal until you get to know them. (laughs) He's currently working on a book manuscript about Jesus' impact on the history of the world. John was born in Illinois, which might possibly explain why he is a Cubs fan. He's married to Nancy, his wife of 28 years. They have three children, Laura, Mallory, and Johnny. What Michael and I appreciate the most about John is that he's bright, he's articulate, and yet he's completely humble and genuine. He exemplifies the kind of leader that we hope will characterize Gordon students and graduates for the years to come. So please join me in welcoming today Dr. John Ortberg. Well, it was worth coming just to hear that. Um, thank you, and what a wonderful occasion. Um, congratulations, Michael and Rebecca, on fabulous days that lie before you. Congratulations to Gordon on selecting a president who looks like he could be a student. And, uh, has a voice that is so needed, not just by Gordon, but by the evangelical world, and beyond that, the church, and beyond that, the world. We are all so thrilled that God has put you in this place. And it seemed fitting to read an educational charter today from an earlier administration. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And this text, as you know, called the Shema, was the central text of all Israel, who said that, Education, knowledge, wisdom begins here. Love God. Love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Do what God says. Put these commandments on your hearts. Teach them to your children. Strap them to your arms and your head. Write them on your walls. David Instone Brewer has written on how passionate Israel was about these words, the Shema, as soon as a boy could speak. His father was to teach him these words. This passage may well have been the very first passage that Jesus memorized. And when Shema said to love God with all your soul, it was understood to mean that you should be willing to die rather than betray God. 
That's why Israel alone of all ancient people would be executed rather than convert to another religion. Jewish martyrs would recite these words as they were being executed when Jesus was on the cross and breathed his last. It may be that these words were the final ones that ran through his mind. Wisdom said God is to be the first word you utter when you're a child and the last breath you exhale when you die. They believed that this command said something wonderful about God, that God wants to be loved. Here, Israel, there is one God. He's real, and he's very large, and he should be feared, and all ancient peoples feared the gods. He should also be obeyed. Children need to learn that God is concerned with justice and ethics and character in a day when, I, when spirituality in our world is often prized for its identity or its power, but does not address character. There is a God who is concerned with justice and ethics and character, and this God wants to be loved, and therefore people are to learn to put their ultimate trust no place else, in no human foundation. When I was real small, I used to play a game called Daddy's Home. And when my father came home, when I heard that door open up sometime after five, I would go racing down the stairs, and I didn't even bother to look. When I got towards the bottom, I would take off in a flying leap because I knew that the briefcase would be set down and those arms would be open wide, and he would catch me. Daddy's home. And I did this until one day the game had to stop. My father couldn't even bring himself to tell me. My mom had to pull me aside and said, you can't play Daddy's home anymore. I said, why not? She said, well, it's not that... Your father doesn't love you anymore because he'll always love you. And it's not that he won't be there for you because he always will. It's just that you're 37 years old now. And, you know, the day comes when human arms grow weak and flabby and they cannot hold you up. Hear, O Israel, there is a God. The Lord our God is one and his arms never grow weak and he never sleeps, he never slumbers, and he is good ethics and worship come together in him. And he is the God who wants to be loved. He is a lovable God. And to know him is the beginning of what it means to be formed, to be educated as a good person. And so every devout Israelite would say this text, the Shema, twice every day. Verse 7, it said, when you lie down, and when you get up. The very first line of the Mishnah, the oral law, is when may the Shema be recited? It's like they were so excited about saying these words, they wanted to know, how early can I say it when I get up in the morning? When can it be recited? How does the day start? Now this would be wisdom, because we do not live in that world. Our day begins with a certain kind of clock. What do we call the clock that begins our day? Very interesting language, an alarm clock, not an opportunity clock, not a... <laughs> resurrection clock, be alarmed another day. To Israel, wisdom was not just about how do I choose a right home, how do I choose a nice spouse, how do I get a nice job, and knowledge was not restricted to math or to science. They were so passionate about this God, about knowing this God, about loving this God, that they wanted to give him the first word of the day. And so the first question in the oral law was, when can I start? And the rabbis would say, it's when there's enough light to be able to distinguish the color white from the color blue, then you can recite Shema. And they wanted to know, at night, how soon can I say Shema? And the rabbis would say, when the light of the first evening stars appear, then you can recite Shema in the evening. It was so important that if they were on the road, the rabbi said, and you're reciting Shema, and a friend comes, don't interrupt this recitation even to greet a friend. They loved these words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love God with everything you've got. Teach this to your children. Impress them on your mind. Write them down. Why did they love those words so much? Why did they get so carried away saying them? Well, because in these words, in this book, were the answers to what Dallas Willard says are the great questions of life, the questions that all human beings, quite apart from any religious affiliation, wrestle with. What is real? What can you count on? What's the good life? What's a good person? And how does a good person get formed or shaped? 
And this is an understanding of education, the formation of good persons who know in all fields, including moral truth and spiritual truth, this is a gift that our world desperately needs to receive from Gordon and for which Gordon and you, Michael, can be a profound and winsome voice. Because we live in a world where there's a lot of confusion around this. Not long ago, the president of Yale welcomed his students. Yale, George Marsden writes about this, actually was formed when a group of Congregationalists were concerned that the Harvard faculty was getting too liberal and producing too many liberal clergymen, and so Yale got formed. Recently, the president of Yale welcomed students with these words, we cannot supply you with a philosophy of education any more than we can supply you with a philosophy of life. That has got to come from your own act of learning, your own choices, your own wisdom. Think for yourself. Now, when it comes to certain areas, when it comes to history, if you say Columbus discovered America in 1805, we will impose our beliefs on you. In physics, if you say that E equals MC cubed, we will impose our beliefs on you. But when it comes to values, when it comes to wisdom, think for yourself. In other words, as William Willimon wrote, the university has absolutely no clue what you're supposed to be doing here. We have a smorgasbord of courses, a buffet line of faculty. Whether that adds up to something called wisdom by the time you graduate, we do not know. And the people of Israel could not have had a more countercultural message about the reality of moral and spiritual knowledge. It's fabulous words from the book of Job. There's a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Human technology is quite remarkable. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? People do not comprehend its worth. It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing. Destruction and death say only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it, and He alone knows where it dwells. For He views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. And therefore, the great text of Israel begins with the word, hear, hear, O Israel. It doesn't say, O Israel, think for yourselves. O Israel, go with your gut, follow your happiness, maximize your bliss. You are the autonomous center of the universe. It says, hear, listen, be still, be quiet. This is Torah, this is law, this is wisdom. Strap it on your arms, tie it to your head, put it on the door, paint it on the gate write about it in journals, discuss it in classes, study it deeply, wrestle with it in the dining hall, and above all, remember, a teacher came into the world some time ago, and he had questions, answers to the great questions that all human beings wrestle with, and those answers have simply never been surpassed, quite apart from anybody's religious affiliation, and how desperately our world needs to hear in a voice that is winsome and civil and thoughtful and reflective. There is one who came with answers to the great questions of life. What is real? At the heart of reality is a person, a God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit is the reason why anything exists. This universe did not create itself. Matter does not work that way. At the core of all existence is a person, and this is why we know that every person has such unique worth, and we know this. We don't just believe it. We don't just prefer it. We know it. And then who is well off? The Bible's word for well off is blessed. And the teacher said, blessed now are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Not just the rich, not just the attractive, not just winners in the genetic lottery. Blessed is anyone who is interactively engaged with God living in the reality and love and power and presence of a personal God. And the Bible speaks about this life as knowing 
God. How badly those of us inside and outside the church need to understand that knowing God, which means knowing about God and living with God, only one time in all the Bible is the definition given of eternal life. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, who is a good person. Now our society doesn't talk a lot about this directly, but we all want to be worthy of admiration. Dallas writes that one of the places to see how fundamental this question is, who's a good person? is in obituaries. Obituaries rarely say things like, she had a fine figure and a thick head of hair and wonderfully white teeth. Or he ate, drank, drove expensive cars, dated numerous supermodels, and was merry. They don't say things like that. They talk about this is a good person. Fascinating exercise is to look at the difference between the content of obituaries and the content of advertisements. Because advertisements are about who's living the good life how to get great hair, a great body, great looks, great money, great success, great teeth, great sex, great food, great widescreens TV. Precisely the things obituaries don't mention because we don't want people to think that we were selfish. We were afraid there is a chasm between living the good life and being a good person. And Jesus, the teacher, says that a good person is one who is immersed and pervaded by the love of God. And it's possible for someone to become a good person. And the way that good persons are formed are by becoming followers, disciples, apprentices, students of Jesus. Neil Plantinga wrote a wonderful article about how Jesus um, adds to the Shema, following the Septuagint, he says, also, love the Lord your God, not just with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, but with all your mind. That's part of why Gordon is here. Part of why universities in Paris and Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and Yale arose is people said, following Jesus' words, we want to love God with all our minds. And so there arose faculty, so interesting, people called professors because they have something to profess, something that is true and worthy of naming. And evangelicals have not always done a good job of loving God with all our minds. I grew up in an evangelical church for which I'm very grateful, but where the life of the mind was not always prized. When I went to get a PhD in clinical psychology, a woman from my church asked, why do you need to study Freud? We have the Bible. And I asked her, have you ever read Freud? Like, can you name a single book that he wrote? Do you understand the difference between projection and reaction formation, or between the conscience and the superego, or between repression and suppression? Whether he's right or wrong, Freud was a doctor and neurologist. He won the Goethe Prize for the German language. He was one of the dominant minds of the 20th century. And you can tell me he can be dismissed, and uh, you can't even come up with the title of a single book he ever wrote? It's the last time my mom talked with me about psychology. <laughs> uh, Mark Knoll, you know, some years ago wrote about the scandal of the evangelical mind. The scandal was there ain't much at one. Has written more recently a wonderful little book, Jesus Christ and the Life of the Mind. He writes about the profound implications of a high Christology for intellectual life. He says, for believers, to be studying created things is to be studying the works of Christ. There is no object of study for someone who has a high view of this Jesus by which we are not studying, not thinking after him, his own thoughts. The act of study is itself rightly understood an act of worship because we're to love God with all our minds. And that's why Gordon is here. That's why Michael is here. Michael, I was thinking about how you have been gifted to help us in such wonderful ways. 
uh, how providential it is that Gordon should have the person who researched and then wrote Faith in the Halls of Power with all that insight and all those connections to leaders, evangelical leaders in education and government and business. And now you are one of those evangelical leaders in education and in a position to shape evangelical leaders in government and statecraft. And all those evangelical leaders in business with their vast, uncommitted, uh, personal financial resources are your new best friends. And <laughs> many of them are here today. And uh, when you call them, and you will call them, they will know why you are calling. <laughs> how the church, how our world needs a place to learn to love God with all our minds. And I want to say a final word about the cost of education. But it helps to frame it for those of us who follow this Jesus. You know, one of the great impacts of Jesus, people who write about education, one of the impacts of Christianity is uh, in the ancient Greco-Roman world, learning was loved. Human beings always love to learn. We are homo sapiens. We're those who want to know, who want to become wise. But it was generally restricted to children of elite families. And when this movement called the church arose, people remember they followed somebody that would just teach everybody, women as well as men, young children of all kinds, Gentiles, Samaritans. And so they said, we've got to catechize everybody. And this idea kept bursting out and bursting out. Martin Luther said once he would write a book about parents who neglect the education of their children. There's a direct quote from Luther. He said, in this book, I shall really go after the shameful, despicable, damnable parents who are no parents at all, but despicable hogs and venomous beasts devouring their own young. <laughs> Luther had a hard time expressing his emotions about education sometimes. <laughs> you can use that in the marketing department here if you'd like to. Um, you know, in America, the first law to require mass education was passed not far from here, in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and its title was the Old Deluder Satan Act. We don't give snappy titles to legislation like that anymore in our day. <laughs> the Old Deluder Satan Act, because they believed that to live in ignorance, delusion, was a work of the evil one, and that we are called to love God with all our minds and to help all human beings in the most winsome, thoughtful, reflective, honoring way that is possible, to come to love God with all our minds. Hear, O oh world, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But this opportunity to be educated, to be formed, comes at a great cost, which is not primarily financial. The formation of truly excellent persons requires not just the informing of ignorant minds, but the cleansing of sinful hearts. And the ultimate price was paid by our teacher who is our Savior on a cross at Calvary. And he who knew no sin became sin so that we could know God. So to Michael and Rebecca and the faculty and the staff and the trustees and the students and all of us, May that mind which was in Christ Jesus also be in you. Amen. I'll be sharing a song based on the great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and asking you to sing with me at the end.
has always been faithful to all of us in this room, hasn't he? He has loved us since we were small children. Before we were born, he knew us. Before I give the closing prayer, I'd like to say just a word of, uh, about Michael. Uh, he and Rebecca moved to Dallas, uh, where I serve as president at Dallas Baptist University, uh, back in the 1990s, right after they graduated from, uh, from Baylor. He, um, he didn't know I was a Baptist University president, but my son was in his Sunday school class as an eighth grader, and I had never met Michael before or Rebecca. Michael took such an interest in my son every time he missed a, missed a Sunday, and we were gone a good bit because the kids would go with me when I would speak different places. Michael would call to see, well, David, we sure did miss you this week. Uh, he took David to, to lunch one day. He did all these special things for all of the young people. And I decided I would call him on the phone and just thank him. And when I called him, he was surprised to find out that I was a, a college, Baptist College president. And I said, well, why don't we just have lunch sometime together? I'd just like to get to know you a little bit better. I did and found out that uh, he was gonna go into the, wanted to go into the ministry at the time. He was in computer work and business. Uh, and I encouraged him to, um, to pursue that, and uh, I said, well, why don't you just come work for me for a while until you go off to seminary? He was going to come to Princeton and be with Mr. Gallup and others, and um, uh, so he came and worked uh, that summer for me before he went to, uh, to Princeton and then served uh, every summer because the family, so many of the family members lived there in Dallas, they would come back and uh, he would work in the summers for me for four or five summers. It was that first summer, though, that I said to him, Michael, I think one of these days you're going to be a Christian college president. 
And I think you better get ready for that. I think the Lord's calling you to do that. He said, oh, no, no, I want to do, uh, be a minister. I want to maybe teach, do all these other things. But I thought way back then the Lord had called him. And I think you're so fortunate to have someone here who loves the Lord with all of his heart, but who also has a servant heart to take an interest in that eighth grade boy who really needed some encouragement way back then, somebody to love on him. And he'll take an interest in the students here. He'll be interested in so many of you and in your personal lives. And Rebecca's been right there with him all along the way. Uh, and they are such a great team. So could I lead us in prayer now, please? Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for this wonderful message we've heard today. We've been able to worship you, to, to think about how faithful you have been to us. I want to pray right now, Father, for wisdom, wisdom that can only come from you, from Michael, in the months and years ahead. Pray for courage, courage that can only come from you, Father. Pray for a servant heart for Michael and for Rebecca. Father, please protect them and take good care of them and help them to always feel your presence close to them as they lead this wonderful Christian college. Father, most of all today, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to give all of us abundant life and eternal life. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us today.